everybody to the fourth edition of health take of the bengal medical and medical super speciality hospital our pwc is our knowledge partner we have dr rana mehta chairing the session today who is partner and healthcare leader of pwc on the today's session now is panel discussion on role of technology in care caution prevention in normal life as panelists we have dr shuman chakraborty from iit kharagpur he is institute chair professor and sir jc bose national fellow dean sponsored research and industrial consultancy and professor of department of mechanical engineering as i mentioned from iit kharagpur professor shantanu k tripathi hod calcutta school of tropical medicine and department of clinical and experimental uh, pharmacology Professor Dr. Rakesh Yadav, Professor of Cardiology, Ames, and Dr. Deepak Nandi, MD, from USA. So, with this, I would request Dr. Rana Mehta to please take the session forward. No, thank you, Angina, and thank you for having me on board. It's indeed a pleasure to uh, be chairing this session, and I'm honored uh, to have such distinguished panelists. So, I think uh, you know, 2020 has actually been a momentous year. Uh, for both us and the world because uh, uh, and i was just reflecting on some of the things you know the year actually taught us uh, one of the things i think is that uh, we we always envisage that uh, if there was a tragedy it would be either a war or a natural disaster but nobody actually looked at a pandemic so clearly we now have uh, in india beyond acute and chronic disease we have a triple burden of disease and this was a very humble assailant a spiky ball of uh, lipids with a little bit of rna which really caused a globally synchronized crisis and brought the world to its knees uh, it was also for the first time we realized that you know healthcare can cause an economic meltdown globally economic meltdowns are caused by financial crises the caused by natural disasters the caused by war but uh, it very became very apparent that we also found that uh, you know uh, there's exponential growth of the virus but uh, it declines very slowly the the other thing i think is that uh, while we looked at it from another point of view last year has also been the year when we have had the greatest amount of disinformation and conspiracy theories and i was reading that uh, to some extent we doctors are responsible it's very difficult for to explain to a person how a virus can cause such havoc so he's likely to believe that you know a billionaire probably invented it and that so i think 2021 we should be clear of that they say that the first casualty of uh, war is truth and i think the first casualty of the pandemic was trust uh, i think a lot of trust deficit in all countries between the scientists the politicians the doctors the care providers and we see that even lingering in as the vaccination process starts i think the positive components of this is that uh, at least in india healthcare became part of the political discourse this is the first time uh, if you looked at the union budget it started with healthcare it normally only has a passing reference the second component i think globally is uh, came out is uh, does healthcare actually is it a right or is it something the government needs to provide and more of more people are to us going that it's actually a right Uh, and we will see healthcare in the forefront to drive economies globally and finally i think uh, you know the component of which i think why uh, today we are now inoculating a subcontinent is the fact that the humans as a species uh, have been so successful because of collaboration so i think a doctor in calcutta can speak to a doctor in kansas and talk to him and tell him about you know how the virus but the virus can can't do that and that's why i think we humans as a race have prevailed as i move on to the topic i think it's very interesting because uh, you know one of the things is that uh, we probably had a digital learning which we would have done in 5 years in 5 months so either you were digitally savvy or you were left out it also showed us that there are three axes to care one of the axes to care is actually a geographical axis you know do you have a hospital next to you but 70% of india's healthcare infrastructure is limited to 20 cities 
So the geographical axis is weak. The second component is a financial axis. Can you really afford the hospital which is next to you? And the government today moving away from a provider to a payer uh, is doing exactly that. So through Ayushman Bharat providing ac financial access to 500 million people. But I think in India, you know, we're going to have a problem with both accesses because resources are constrained, number of doctors, capital, the ability of the government to pay over a large period of time to a, a growing number of uh, people. So I think that comes to the most important part that we need to look at a technological access to care. And using technology, how can access be provided? And how can access be provided where you're able to deal with most complications before they actually become, they come to a level where morbidity and mortality increases. So I'll, uh, I'll stop with uh, Professor Suman Chakravarti and uh, how do you see technology playing a role in healthcare in the coming decade? Doctor, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So thank you very much. And um, uh, first of all, I express my uh, gratitude to uh, the BCCI and all the organizers for inviting me in this very, very illustrious panel. I see you know, all experts uh, in real healthcare domain. And perhaps I am an odd person out who is by training uh, not a healthcare specialist, but in some way or the other, I have uh, you know, been into the scenario for some time. And uh, in a way, I can give my perspective definitely of how technology is going to impact healthcare or it has started already impacting healthcare, keeping in mind the barriers of access that you have just talked about, the geographical barrier, the economic barrier, and uh, you know, other relevant barriers. So if uh, you uh, kindly allow, I can share uh, my presentation and talk about it briefly for about 10 minutes. And um, uh, I mean, uh, so I'll just uh, share my So I hope the, uh, this presentation is visible. And um, if it is, I will just make it a full screen. And, uh, sure, please go ahead. Uh, so I would talk about the role of technology in affordable diagnostics. The role of technology in healthcare is really a very, very broad topic. And uh, I do not have much experience with the entire scenario, entire the 360 degree gamut of technological intervention in healthcare, but I have some experience in affordable diagnostic technologies. And the whole uh, perspective revolves around uh, um, uh, the issues that the moderator has just uh, mentioned, that we have a country where large number of uh, uh, the healthcare amenities and facilities are there, but they are skewed only within a few uh, cities. And majority of the population does not get access to even the basic healthcare amenities and facilities, even primary healthcare. So as argumentative Indians, we always complain and we always blame others. We say doctors do not want to go to these places and so many other factors, but we often forget about the role of technology in terms of diagnostic technologies, the conventional technologies which work in high-end labs do not necessarily work in rural environment. So to take care of these, uh, uh, I have seen the emergence of these kind of model, which in very simplified terminology, I say a health ATM type of a system or a health kiosk based system, where you have a digital healthcare platform uh, in which there is a health kiosk where there is a frontline health worker who is a minimal, minimally trained uh, rural boy or girl, not even a school final uh, pass out, he or she 
interfaces with the patient with a medical uh, decision making um, uh, software where it does not necessarily immediately make a decision but the data is entered and via telemedicine the entire uh, data is presented to a doctor who is sitting in the big city the doctor uh, if necessary also uh, goes to a real time consultation with the patient via telephone and along with the data comes up with a recommendation so far this model is quite effective because we have connectivity we have software we have a business model we have a training model in place also for the frontline health workers which is certified by the government but the bottleneck comes in diagnostics because when the doctor recommends some of the basic diagnostic tests those are either prohibitively expensive for these people to afford even if they are affordable the infrastructure is not permissible so that you know those tests cannot be conducted in addition there are other issues because of which high end lab tests will not work in these extreme point of care environments so all these demand some disruptive innovations in diagnostics the issues are that you do not get high quality power which you get in high end labs the environment is often hot dusty and humid not like a controlled lab environment the storage uh, and uh, other uh, facilities which are controlled laboratory procedures they are not there or even if they are there they are available only in a centralized form the supply chain of these uh, materials and devices that does not exist at all trained technicians are not routinely available and of course the price sensitivity is extremely strong so all these require a different type of diagnostic paradigm for example possibly substituting the automated hematology analyzer based lab tests with the point of care diagnostic test where one can have a uh, one drop of finger pricked blood and uh, load that on a paper strip and do some analytics based on the reactions which take part in the paper strip the analytics are either smartphone enabled or they may be a portable electronic equipment enabled or they may be even computer interfaced the whole idea is that there is a small time gap between the test and the result dissemination the test is portable it can be functional with limited resources easy to handle mass manufacturing is possible inexpensive infrastructure is not that much required and uh, these are easy to monitor but the big question is the golden question are these enough accurate for a medical doctor to believe or to expect these results as gold gold standards so i will give you some uh, example maybe one slide for each very very brief slides this is a glucose detection on a printed paper strip so this is a paper strip uh, in which you have a source pad where the blood is dispensed and there is a membrane which uh, filters out the red blood cells and the plasma by capillary action goes to a glucose reagent uh, chamber i mean because of the interdisciplinary nature of this panel i do not want to get into all the technical details but the summary is that after the reactions at the reaction spot there is a color develop and in this case the color is a reddish brown color and by training with patient sample based data the color map is calibrated with the glucose concentration and that calibration is fed to a mobile app so the mobile app is able to uh, interpret unknown samples and predict the glucose concentration a similar advancement is the hemoglobin detection device uh, which we have developed 
hemoglobin is a is a real public health problem where it is strongly linked with community health maternal health child health and so many other factors so this is again a paper strip based uh, diagnostic platform which can interface with a smartphone enabled platform in a very similar manner in which a credit card interfaces with a credit card reader and we could detect uh, the hemoglobin concentrations to a limit of even 3 to 4 gram per deciliter as validated by a automated hematology analyzer we also have invented technologies where we could do multiple tests with a single drop of blood for example glucose and bilirubin test with a single drop of blood by using a technology known as paper and pencil based microfluidics innovated by our group beyond these sort of routine blood tests we could also develop a simple paper based platform for evaluating antibiotic resistance antibiotic resistance here there are uh, highly qualified doctors i need not explain to them that what is the role of antibiotic resistance in terms of the treatment protocol in modern times in many cases the very standard antibiotics for certain infection do not work for a particular patient if we can isolate the bacteria this is a particular example where e coli is isolated from the cultured urine sample for urinary tract infection it is brought in contact with an antibiotic which is being tested for these are just two layers of paper in a folded form then there is a third layer which has a colored chemical known as chromogen which is blue but once it comes with the uh, product of the antibiotic and bacterial suspension reaction and if there is a susceptibility the color of the chromogen changes from blue to pink so in that way it is possible for a doctor to have this kind of a small paper strip unit to uh, you know keep in the office and come up with a recommendation of what should be the ideal antibiotic treatment for a given patient in terms of personalized medicine finally i will come up with an example uh, which is a simplified nucleic acid based test for uh, viral infections this is a device which we have developed at iit kharagpur known as covirap so this is a substitution of the real time pcr machine where it is a rna test but the thermal cycling of the uh, pcr machine along with the complex optics based detection is substituted by a 5000 rupees portable device unit and uh, not just for covid it is a sort of a paradigm shift where the whole idea is that we can use this for a large number of diseases where the same nucleic acid based testing format can be adapted today it is covid but it, we do not believe nobody here in this forum believes that covid is the only disease which is affecting the humanity there are so many other infectious diseases and even non communicable diseases these diseases are important and these are going to be important not only that by some way or the other a new pandemic may affect humanity and these will keep on affecting us time and again so it is very important to have a generic platform for such low cost diagnostic tests i will just uh, you know give a little bit different type of example where instead of a body fluid it's a body imaging based diagnostics where a simple portable uh, thermal imager is able to screen the oral pre cancer and cancer which is very very important in the rural population so the whole objective for these kinds of technological interventions is to get out of labs to get into a 
extreme resource poor setting this is a place called as barra in the district birbhum west bengal uh, close to shiuri but uh, you know, it is uh, extremely resource poor where there we found that there are people who have never done even a simple uh, you know blood glucose or hemoglobin test so these are you know are very basic uh, you know tests that uh, people who otherwise look for but these uh, were never done so we conducted some you know field uh, settings field trials and we try to you know uh, come up with solutions where uh, frontline health workers with the help of our diagnostic technologies were in a position to uh, you know give uh, certain uh, you know diagnostic solutions which are accessible to people so all in all my main summary or take home is that technology is going to be progressively important but not to an extent that you know it becomes such a high end that people cannot afford at the same time once we simplify the technology there is a chance that the test results are inaccurate so we have to come to a balance of affordability simplicity and accuracy and that is where all the major technological interventions in healthcare in general and diagnostics in particular should lead to so thank you very much this is all uh, you know what i wanted to present no uh, thank you uh, dr suman i think very uh, illuminating and how you can look at both accessibility affordability uh, so in india we spend about 3% uh, of the cost on test but 70% of the decisions are based on that 3% so it's very important to get uh, your readings here because the doctor otherwise is is just taking a shot in the dark i'll move next to uh, you know professor tripathi and uh, professor tripathi uh, you like especially in the communicable diseases and uh, you know especially with the relationship to tropical medicine uh, how do you see technology panning out yeah uh, thank you very much uh, yes uh, particularly when you talk of tropical diseases again this is something again uh, what do we mean by or what we refer to uh, which kind of diseases are to be considered as tropical diseases that's also uh, needs a little explanation or at at a uh, in the past when we actually uh, classified diseases as tropical diseases it had a different meaning uh because of the tropical climate the diseases that were more prevalent uh they were actually grouped under tropical diseases but then given the uh kind of uh uh into huge improvement in in the transportation and uh, uh exchange quick exchange uh travel etc uh many of the the tropic the, the prevalence of the tropical diseases are not necessarily only limited to so called tropical countries so that's a different uh, uh, debate altogether but then by tropical diseases mostly we we refer to communicable diseases and more correctly the infectious diseases as we know that all infectious diseases are actually broadly uh, caused by four different kinds of uh, infections whether it is bacteria or viruses or fungi or parasites and the parasites are different kind of parasites like whether it is malaria or whether helminths or etc so uh, yes uh, when you talk of infectious diseases uh, uh, yes there is a huge huge uh, contribution of technology truly speaking i would say that uh, it may not be very directly related to the disease diagnostics but uh, the advancement or ad, uh, advances in management of infectious diseases or for that matter control of infectious diseases was possible through some of the very important simple technologies like uh, uh, availability or ensuring uh, good sanitation okay access to drinking water etc uh, but then and we know that the availability of antibiotics and when again coming back to the technologies technologies broadly speaking uh, health technologies actually refer to 
medicines uh, or drugs devices different kind of medical devices different kind of diagnostics and besides that also the different kind of the standard operating procedures even the uh, electronic health records etc they are also considered as healthcare technologies now in area of infectious diseases or for that matter tropical diseases there has been huge huge uh, kind of contribution in the last uh, uh, less than a century i would say starting from the advent of the antibiotics to come in the picture of treatment of bacterial diseases only in the last say five or six decades or seven decades huge advancement has taken place and to the extent that uh, not only we have used antibiotics uh, in fighting the infectious diseases but at the same time uh, on the going to the other extreme people have started also misusing antibiotics so when you say people we actually also mean the doctors included so uh, therefore uh, it's not really uh, enough to consider to to invent newer technologies but the application of the te such technologies in the most judicious manner uh, also uh, it matters a lot okay improper use of technology is also is not going to really do what is desirable what is desired so one should also keep that in mind and uh, on the other hand uh, particularly in terms of the in the last one decade what we have seen about the uh, about the, uh, the the digital technologies that has actually made a huge stride in the last one decade and particularly in the last few years okay so uh, there is a huge huge promise and uh, but at the same time there is a concern that uh, accessibility that uh, how many people actually even today okay have the uh, ability to actually reach out or making use of using technologies so uh, it becomes the responsibility of the inventor uh, the society at large and also the elected governments ensure that the technologies are appropriately used number one and it is made accessible to the most of the people for whom they are meant uh, regarding the uh, technological solutions in tropical diseases in the recent times we know that uh, if we if you ask me one of the very uh, more recent uh, advancements is management of mdr tb multi drug resistant tuberculosis we all know uh, what havoc it was doing and the latest example is of course the sars cov okay uh, whether you call it a tropical disease or not that's a different matter because sars cov 2 has actually baffled the whole mankind that uh, it really didn't uh, uh, didn't uh, satisfy our speculations that we have predicted over the last one year that uh, let the, uh, the the season change and come a different uh, climatic condition and the virus will uh, just vanish but that has never occurred this is a virus which which has the potential to survive and uh, do whatever you want it wanted to do through all seasons all temp temperate situations all climates okay baffling the mankind and the scientists so uh, but then uh, the human race has also uh, uh, shown the uh, kind of kind of uh, approach okay in the last one year and uh, within such a short time we have come out with so many different vaccine candidates and we can really we have started really dreaming that uh, the vaccines have already shown their uh, whatever was bizarre there are some some amount of reluctance and hesitancy among some section of the public and including the doctors again uh, but then uh, it it must be said that we have as a human race we have really done wonders in trying to fight this pandemic viral pandemic of sars cov 2 so yes uh, there has been huge huge uh, achievements in the field of fighting tropical diseases and in specifically and in general all infectious diseases in the last few decades okay thank you uh, thank you uh, professor tripathi so i think uh, there'll be there'll be a new paradigm as we look uh, head in and using technology uh, i'll next go to you know professor rakesh yadav uh, 
so professor yeah the uh, one of the things i think the pandemic did teach us is that uh, most of in, in a typical disease uh, you know the patient is at risk but uh, when it came to covid i think the patient the doctor the caregiver all were at risk so yeah. evidently you know our healthcare infrastructure is not designed for this as a result many of the elective procedures for a couple of months did stop you know increasing both mor- morbidity and mortality so how do you see the role of technology going ahead to ensure the continuity of care continues thank you very much for that i'm sorry i have not opened my video because it's very poor so uh, is that audible yeah you audible but we have a lot of background noise no okay okay hello no i am audible yeah this is better please go ahead i'm going to i'm not able to hear can can you hear uh, professor no. yadav ah uh, dr yadav we are not being able to hear you maybe because of the background noise uh, do we come back to after the next speaker that we help i think mahata we may come back to prof- sure, sure after the next speaker sure. and ha uh, if if ha uh, if you can mute uh, that line so that we don't get the background noise uh, yeah. i'll come next to you know uh, dr deepak nande uh dr deepak i think you have a really vantage point when it comes to newer technologies because uh, i think sitting in new york you've seen how uh, the healthcare system in the us uh, which is also fairly splintered but it really used technology to the end uh, where teleconsultations went up and they gradually come down but even then uh, i think there's going to be a new normal in the interaction between uh, the physician and the patient what are some of those interesting technologies you've identified uh, which will change the paradigm of healthcare and how how many of them are replicable in an emerging market scenario hey uh good afternoon um, thank you to bcci dr ravin chakravarty to anjana goha for the invitation so i wanted to give you some glimpses of the latest healthcare technology that we have been viewing at uh, for the last 10 years we have been providing telemedicine consults that is video consults to the to over 800 rural nursing homes in the united states in and these are very rural nursing homes using uh the wifi technology we have been providing and this pandemic really brought telemedicine out in the front and the center but i was very impressed with dr suman chakrabarty's thing of how to bring technology to the poorest of the poor people in the rural with one drop of blood recognizing that there is a lot of other challenges challenges like weather challenges like logistics transportation so I, let me give you some glimpses of the latest technology here we have in the making of a healthcare app whereby using any smartphone one would be able to use the camera of the smartphone to do a retina scan so you do a retina scan and this can be edu Uh, the art of teaching how to do a scan using the camera of an phone of a, a mobile phone an iphone i've used the iphone one would be able to use the retina scan and that retina scan would then be analyzed in the best digital lab using ibm watson's back technology and 
biomarkers of most diseases could be identified, including most cancers, using this retina scan. One, one then does not have to take blood, one do not have to do any transportation. There is no issue of logistics. You just do a simple scan and uh, run the scan against the biomarkers. With this data analysis, you can zero in in most diseases. And I'm talking about most communicable diseases, diseases of the tropical countries, and including cancer. So this is one technology that is in the making. It is in the form of an app, very cheap, and yet not driven by any kind of challenges of the logistics and be available in the remotest area, but then being detected and diagnosed in the best university labs at Stanford and at Columbia. So this is one thing that I uh, have looked into and it is mesmerizing. The second thing that I would talk about is from my alma mater, Dr. Deepak Chopra, my alma mater being the all in the Institute of Medical Sciences, he has introduced a technology during this pandemic, what is called PV. PV is almost like Siri or Alexa. It is a virtual assistant. PV has successfully intervened and prevented suicide in the last 12 months for almost over 1,000 patients. So basically, you using a smartphone at no cost, you get to PV, PIWI, and you start communicating with PV, and PV starts providing you mental health support. And this has been a big challenge during this pandemic. We found that almost 70% of the patients who came out of the corona disease had issues, had significant mental health issues. And there was a lot of teenage suicide, young adult suicide. There was a lot of depression and anxiety. So one can go to this site, PV. One can get successful mental health interventions, continuous free psychotherapy interventions to make sure that there is no suicide. You, I would recommend every audience to watch a movie called Her, H-E-R. Her is a movie that one can watch in Prime Video Amazon, and one can see how in that movie, Her, using virtual assistant, one can go through continuous mental health, psychotherapy, and the, the quality is much better than most psychiatrists that they are able to provide. Because what happens is, at the back, the virtual assistant keeps learning about you and, and keeps using the data of other interventions of other patients and is able to do cross interventions and come up with the best solutions, which will become effective and which become so therapeutic that you, you the dropout rate decreases and you keep coming back again and again. The third thing that we will talk about is the in the year 2020, Nobel Prize for Medicine was given out for a technology called CRISPR. CRISPR was the technology that won the Nobel Prize, and this was done at Stanford by a lady called Jennifer Dudna. And CRISPR is nothing but gene editing. Gene editing that bacteria do so that viruses are not able to kill the bacteria. So this is something protective that bacteria implemented so that bacteria, when they are infected by viruses, CRISPR. We have seen the use of CRISPR in modern medicine, which I've already started. And based on the CRISPR technology, one is able to do gene editing and thereby remove a lot of diseases which would otherwise be inherited. And in the past, you would have to do an abortion. And nobody can refute the technology of the monoclonal antibody 
which is rapidly removing away many forms of cancer in the last five to seven years. So these are the glimpses of technology that I have seen in the United States being used, which has been extremely effective and which is cutting edge. And yet it can be brought to the rural villages, especially things like the retina scan I just I talked about. Thank you very much. Uh, no, thank you, Dr. Nandi. I think that's uh, that's really very illuminating because uh, many of these have a lot of application in India because I think one of the biggest thing, uh, especially in oncology, is that detection is very poor. And we detect patients uh, when they're probably at a stage where mortality and morbidity is sort of assured. Uh, and treatment also becomes much, much more expensive, which the country can't afford. Uh, I'll go back to uh, Dr. Rakesh Yadav, if, uh, if you're audible, uh, would you want to talk about, uh, you know, how, how the paradigm on the cardiology side? Dr. Yadav? Uh, I think Dr. Yadav is not able to join. So I think we have a couple of questions which are coming from the audience and I'll uh, run them through and I'll ask all the panelists to sort of chime in. Uh, the first is very interesting. Uh, you know, what is the cost equality equation of healthcare by allowing pa patients to manage their own health, medical providers to deliver better care and governments to strengthen the underlying health system? So I think uh, someone's asking what, which one would be most effective? from that uh, perspective. Uh, I think it's a combination of three, but uh, uh, Professor Tripathi, why, why don't I begin with you on this question? Uh, would you please uh, briefly repeat the question? So uh, the person's asking that, uh, which one is most effective from a cost perspective? Where should the, gov should the government allow patients to manage their own healthcare or the medical providers to deliver better care or the, should the government spend money on strengthening the underlying healthcare system? I would, I would respond to this uh, in this manner that these are not really mutually exclusive. Okay, mm. All these are actually has their own ages. And uh, yes, there is, time has come when personal health okay, and personal technology, use of health technologies by individual citizens is also becoming more important, particularly from the perspective of prevention, prevention of diseases, okay? whether technology can help uh, an average citizen to keep away from disease, which can be otherwise better avoided by use of technologies. On the other hand, when you think of the institution-based healthcare delivery, yes, it can be uh, optimized much better. Okay, So far as India is concerned, uh, not necessarily accepting for few corporate hospitals, most of the government hospitals, okay, they are not yet has adopted electronic health record. It is extremely, extremely important now. Okay, so uh, there is a huge, big requirement for that. So at the minimum, that should be made as a priority. What I understand, the all the hospitals in the country, okay, particularly the three tier hosp hospitals, as a priority, they should have the electronic health record system. And thereby we can avoid a huge number of the errors okay? uh, and the, uh, the crisis, healthcare crisis, because of the medical errors, which is otherwise caused by manual uh, data, data capture and manual data entries. So that is the second. Otherwise, yes, uh, the government administration also can use as much as possible use of technology. Finally, the uh, summarily, I would say, that you also the, all these technologies, they need to also go through an assessment. And while we are doing the assessment, we should keep in mind the clinical efficacy part of it, the economic evaluation of it and the cost effectiveness analysis, as well as the humanistic part of it. Okay, That uh, economic, clinical and humanistic evaluation of the technologies, and then only possibly we'll be better off in handling and managing the uh, diverse healthcare uh, challenges in the country. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Tripathi. Uh, Dr. Rakesh, uh, Professor Rakesh Yadav, yes, would yes. you... Uh, Sorry. Uh, please go ahead. Yes, yes, I'm able to... Okay, okay. That, uh, what the question you have raised is a very valid question. Even what we are 
seeing in a tertiary care center our non covid healthcare facility has gone drastically now yes technology can help in these situations that is very true but there is a lot of caution in these technology in these things a lot of emergency cases are being not being entertained and what we have seen is that in emergency cases we don't only require the diagnosis we require the treatment which can not very well be given by tele consultations because the tele consultation has a lot of other problem initially it has got a medical legal problem which i think our country has solved it out there is a clear cut guideline in medical legal consultations so what we are facing though this lot of uh, hue and cry and lot of motion of tele consultation on uh, telephonic consultation but practicality is somewhat different here the questions lies that if we are going to curtail the non covid care facility we are going to face the serious uh, challenges in those situations how technology can help in facing this situation is still there's lot of caveat and lot of questions in these things in india so 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 what we always say if we are doing the daily consultation in india uh, we are facing this situation there is 40000 call coming in next two weeks but technically what calls are they called their calls are only when your opd is going to be started the data which is being generated is the wrong data which is being generated in these situations so we have to be very cautious when we are telling that this technology yes they can help but we should not be solely dependent upon this technology second important thing what we are facing nowadays in non covid uh, patient care the things our ccus are limited we are getting all the new equipments which we want we are getting 70000 50000 ventilator but who is going to operate them so yes these challenges we need to address we have 50 or 50000 anesthetics in this country if we have 70000 ventilators who are going to operate them so when we are discussing the challenges in technology in healthcare system we have to also think the logistic and what situation which is prevailing in this country so you you some have a lot of ventilators which are lined up and if you see there's no oxygen connectivity they are not trained anesthetists who are going to operate it there's no trained technician who is going to operate it so yes you are very correct we are facing the serious now i think when the covid admission are less gradually the non covid care has increased but absolutely you are correctly right that so technology we presume that technology is going to help in this situation but uh, there is lot of ava portions which we are facing and i think those ava portions need to be addressed uh, in a proper way once we are happily telling that yes we can overcome these problem with our technical technology development Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Yadav. I think that was very important, and you know, cardiology being such a critical uh, specialty, where you know there is a golden hour. Uh, uh, Dr. Nandi, I'll come back, and we have one of uh, someone who's asked that uh, you know there's there's a huge incidence of non-communicable diseases in India. So we have a twin burden in India. We haven't got rid of uh, you know the communicable diseases. We have the non-communicable, and now we have a pandemic. Uh, so what can be the role of uh, uh, you know basically the role of digital in enhancing the care the both the care of uh, non communicable diseases yeah so uh, non communicable diseases are oncological diseases is like cancer i mean the, that is the bulk of the non communicable diseases then you have these autoimmune disorders autoimmune disorders like rheumatoid arthritis scleroderma sle uh, so you have those buckets uh, autoimmune disorders and oncological disorders and i had spoken previously of using the retina scan app in a way to identify biomarkers which then zeroes in to the particular diseases and the particular relevant specialist is then thereby able to intervene after the primary screening using a video consult specific to the disease and the person and we have also seen the role of 
monoclonal antibodies in autoimmune disorders and also in oncological disorders. The other big bucket of non-communicable disorders are psychiatric disorders. And in the psychiatric disorders I've spoken about and mental health disorders like anxiety, depression, schizophrenia, uh, bipolar disorder, I spoke about uh, the role of uh, PV, P-I-W-I, <coughs> which is an app which takes you through layers of question and then zeroes in on a diagnosis and zeroes in on an intervention. And should it require the intervention of a professional psychiatrist or a professional psychologist, one is able to then successfully use uh, telemedicine to make the appropriate intervention, whether it is in the form of continuous psychotherapy, augmented by medication, or non-augmented with medication. So those are the glimpses I had talked about in terms of inter, uh, interventions in non-communicable disorders. Thank you. Uh, Professor Suman uh, Chakravarti, I'll come to you next. And so one of our uh, audience have asked that, uh, you know, there's a lot of innovation in India and people do come up with very low cost, but uh, generally this is never scaled up or replicated, you know. Um, so there aren't very many examples of uh, where we've been able to scale up and replicate it across India. Uh, what do you think is the reason and what gives you hope now that what you're doing uh, can actually reach every Indian? Uh, this is a very, very important question and I'm glad that uh, this question has been raised. Uh, so you will see that uh, you know, lots of these technologies have been successfully developed in the lab, but they are not actually in use when it goes uh, uh, to the large scale community level. So where are the uh, bottlenecks? There are several levels of bottlenecks. Number one, at the technology development stage itself, there were certain uh, pointers which were not given a serious thought, which can blow up when the technology is brought uh, to a level when it is used in an uncontrolled environment. I'm just giving an example. Uh, I was uh, talking with a, a US-based company who is going to take our technology for this COVID. And uh, then uh, that person was telling an interesting thing that we are uh, going to supply the reagent kits, which uh, the home uh, use, home based users will use. But where is the guarantee that a casual user will not just drink those reagents? I mean, we might sort of, you know, laugh at such a possibility, but one has to make absolutely sure that somebody who is unskilled or you know, ignorant in certain ways or very casual does not disruptively damage what is going on. So that should go into the diagnostics. That should go into the design, number one. I mean, this normally in design uh, is not very strongly catered. Number two is the accuracy. So uh, accuracy is something which is of great importance. So uh, the big problem is that from a consumer point of view, see nowadays the diagnostic devices have become like consumer entities. In all our homes, there are at least three devices I can sure short say. Uh, glucometer, uh, the blood pressure uh, monitoring meter and a pulse oximeter. So nowadays these three are there in you know, all the homes. How, to what extent as consumers, we have given attention to the accuracy of these readouts. We just see how fancy the electronics is, how nice the device looks and all these things. So the quality standard, so that uh, you know, these are you know, reliable in terms of, so if a reading comes out, if it is monitored by a patient and reported to a doctor, the doctor will believe it as a true indicator of giving a clinical recommendation. That uh, you know, that level of uh, uh, you know, reliability on these, that has to be brought in. So these are technical factors, but to me, the more important factors are actually the non-technical factors. I mean, these technical factors can be overcome, 
by various uh, procedures the challenge is that say i am an innovator of a of a diagnostic device now what are the barriers for bringing it from the uh, uh, from a pilot level to a large scale manufacturing and dissemination i have to get an industrial partner where the industrial partner is conversant with the tidbits of healthcare technology it is very very difficult in india at least to get such industrial partners who can manufacture these types of units on a mass scale at the same time have proper experience and expertise in handling with the typical regulatory uh, clearances and other things of medical devices or diagnostic devices i have seen you know talk with you know many of good uh, you know industrial manufacturers but they do not even understand what is cds co approval they do not understand that you know what needs to be uploaded what validation report has to be presented say i have a blood testing device and now somebody is taking the technology now i tell him that you have to do the validation in a nabl accredited diagnostic lab get a proper certification and upload that with all the relevant details in the cds co and then they will make an inspection and then they will then you will get an approval for this kind of uh, you know upscale manufacturing now this entire procedure here is the gray area so engineers know their jobs medical professionals know their jobs but this interface between these two that particular ecosystem has not grown well in india and that is where i think that it is very much suffering not really you know the backbone science or the backbone technology i admit that there are lacuna or there are weaknesses and these can always be taken care of by better design more stringent validation you uh, know more uh, you know detailed um, uh, consult consultation with the clinicians but what happens when the technology is being transferred to a commercial agency who does not have much of an idea of the next the subsequent industrial procedures and steps to make the device available uh, uh, i mean to uh, you know to a large population at a reasonable cost without compromising the quality standards yeah uh, professor tripathi yeah uh, uh, i was just uh, thinking of uh, supplementing what uh, dr shubhan has said he has rightly pointed out but then in my view uh, i think uh, it's better to have the team at the beginning you are you have very rightly pointed out that uh, when you talk of a device whether it is an in vitro diagnostic or any other kind of device ultimately it's going to be a healthcare technology so first of all whether there is a real need for this and whether there is a need gap that it is trying to fulfill that kind of assessment we have to start with that and we need to know there is a, a domain expert is required from the point of view of an engineer biomedical engineer also of course the area healthcare uh, or rather the medical sub specialty area where the device is going to be used so expert from there then there is a regulatory expertise is also required as has been pointed out finally the to market it okay or upscaling it there is of course in between there is a need for validation and then finally the marketing so if from the beginning we we get the steam from the beginning and then proceed the that is a very useful uh, device has been developed but then uh, when you talk of many of us because we are otherwise expert in our own field that what is the regulatory requirement how do you position it whether you can really upscale it and whether anybody uh, a industry would be would agree to put their money into it because they will not put their money until unless they are assured of return of in return on investment so taking all of them from the beginning would be possibly a better strategy rather than uh, being passionate scientist and developing something and then find it is difficult to go further so that's what i wanted to just okay uh, put in thank you
No, I think uh, Dr. Tripathi is very valid because I think uh, while we have individual brilliance, uh, India lacks the ecosystem and that's why, you know, most innovations actually fail. So we, 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 we really can't go and say how many things have been invented in India. While they may be brilliant, but you require the ecosystem. And one thing you mentioned, you require venture capital, private equity, manufacturing, marketing. So it's, it's way beyond just inventing the product. Uh, it's it's like you know uh, discovering the vaccine and vaccinating a subcontinent are yeah. different questions altogether. So I must thank all my panelists. This has been a really enthralling discussion. I've learned a lot. Uh, I must thank all of you for taking time out. Uh, I'm I'm sure we can keep going on. There are many questions which have come, but I'm cognizant of time. So thank you all for being on this panel, and I must thank the audience for being a, such a virtu great virtual. Thank you. Take care. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank Thank you, you very much, much. and uh, goodbye. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Dr. Mehta, Dr. Chakraborty, Dr. Tripathi, Dr. Yadav, and Dr. Nandi. Uh, our next session would be after 10 minutes on technology adoption in healthcare delivery in cardiovascular, chaired by Dr. Ravin Chakraborty, chairperson of the health committee of the Bengal Chamber, and. Uh, Senior Consultant, Interventional Cardiologist, Medical Super Specialty Hospital. And we have, he will also be talking about on Indigo's applications for treatment of pulmonary embolism. We also have Dr. Shubhanan Ray, Interventional Cardiologist, Fortis Hospital. Dr. Abzalur Rahman from Dhaka, Bangladesh. Dr. P.K. Hazra, Intervention Cardiologist of AMRI Kolkata, and Dr. Dilip Kumar, Director, Cardiac Cath Lab, Medical Institute of Cardiac Sciences. So see you in 10 minutes at 5.40 on the session on technology adoption on cardiovascular. Thank you. Thank you very much.